Hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today we are continuing our Kinkfest interview series and today we are going to be talking to Brie Burning about leather culture, dark age play, being a leather little and being femme as well as plenty of other topics I am sure. So Brie, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first off, I'm very excited to be here and to chat with you today. I am Brie Burning, she, her, and they, them pronouns. I am your current International Person of Leather 2020 and also your Northwest Person of Leather 2019. I have been a presenter since 2015 and I have been in our local community as well as traveling internationally uh, since 2010 when I first got into the community. What does it actually mean to be the Northwest person of leather or the international person of leather? So there are lots of different title circuits and different titles within our communities all across the world. And specifically person of leather, that is all about non-discriminatory. It's not about gender. It's not about your race. It's not about the way you look or your age as long as you're 18 and older. And so it really means being someone who identifies as leather. And that can be however you feel that is for you, because as we know, it's a very broad topic. Specifically, Northwest Person of Leather is a, a teaching title, and it's definitely about bringing other people together and the diversity in leather. International Person of Leather is also about diversity, and it is a service title to the community. Well, that's awesome. And I know you just won the international title at Sin in the City just what, last weekend? Yeah, what, oh, just like a little over a week ago. <laughs> awesome. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. It still hasn't quite set in yet, but I'm very excited. Knowing your history with being uh, a, a title holder now, how long have you actually been in to BDSM for, and how did you get to become an educator and be a presenter and be a title holder? So I knew that I was different. Uh, uh, very, very young. I was around five years old, which obviously is not a legal age to do anything. But my mom had noticed that I was very curious about the body. And she started to make sure that I had, you know, healthy education around my own body. And growing up, there was, of course, a lot of literature. And I grew up in the AOL chat room era. Which, mm -hmm. if you anyone remembers that dial-up, <laughs> it's a lot of fun and a lot of chat rooms. And I began to learn about BDSM from literature as well as speaking with other people online. I, of course, couldn't do anything until I was of legal age at 18. So I waited. And being in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have a few local dungeons that I had looked up to find where they would be. I am a pastor's kid. And for me, that was a different experience than some. For me, it was not a very healthy experience. And my uh, biological father ended up finding out and I was outed about oh, uh, being no. a queer person as well as a kinky person. Yeah. So it was a pretty big life changing moment for me right before I turned 18 to be outed. And then to realize that that side of my family was not going to be interested um, and who I was becoming and who I am as a person. So I turned 18 and I went to the Citadel in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, me. And I randomly showed up. I didn't even look at the calendar to see what was going on. I was just so nervous and excited. I took a cab there and then I was welcomed. They had a rope peer group going on and they actually welcomed me and told me all about what I could learn. And they totally understood, you know, turning 18 and being excited. And I dove headfirst into that from that point with getting involved with the community, volunteering for events, helping out at the different parties that were being thrown. And I even got into a service relationship with the owner of the Citadel uh, for about two years. And then kind of from that point on, it was learning from that relationship, learning from my uh, other service partners, and being so involved with a local dungeon or community space really gave me a little bit of a fast track in how things work. You know, putting on a party, how to clean up a party, 
dungeon monitoring, you know, all of the ins and outs. And I started to show interest after about five years into the community. And they said, let's go ahead and have you create a class. What are you passionate about? And my very first class was on self-care. And I started doing that in 2015. And they helped work with me to strengthen my own abilities as a presenter and work alongside other presenters like Shay and Stefanos. And I know you asked a bit about title holding. I have watched many title holders. I have a lot of what I consider my leather family members to have been title holders. And nothing ever quite made sense for me to be interested in doing so because nothing sounded right. The Ms. titles were too gendered. The Mr. titles too gendered. I wasn't like a very fluent boot black, even though I love leather care. And so I just watched and it was fun to go to the contests. But when Northwest Personal Leather came out, I had that feeling in your stomach when you're like, oh no, I think I should uh, look into this. And so it was that moment <laughs> when people started to also poke at me and say, hey, Brie, um, have you heard of this new title? And I said, yes, why do you ask? So that's kind of where it started for me. And I'm a person who really likes to do my research. So I started to research and talk to the producers and find out who were these people. If I was going to represent this community, what does that look like? What are the details and who would be the people I'd be working with? And for me, it was, it felt like coming home just to have a chance to stand on stage, to share my heart with something that aligned so deeply with inside of myself. Yeah, I think title holding is such a wonderful thing. And I, I've never really thought it could be something that I would do myself. But I have so much respect for people who do that because it is so much about really the heart of the community. And I'm really grateful that they've started to expand the diversity of the titles that are out there. I mean, they've always been a lot, but like having something that's very explicitly like the person of leather as opposed to like Mr. or Ms. I think is is in particular such a great improvement. And I think it makes it so more people can represent the leather community in a way that I think probably happened more silently just simply because there wasn't a title there for, for people to represent with. Absolutely. It's really exciting to see. You'll also see more titles now that are called Mix, and it looks like the word MX, but it's pronounced Mix. And that's very specific to non-binary and or genderqueer um, identified people. So it's very specific to represent that diversity that we also have, which is really exciting to see all over. Excellent. Well, I think that covers kind of the basics of how you got into kink and title holding and everything, which I think is really important to know about. I I'm wondering, though, how did you actually make the connection into getting into leather culture specifically? Was it something that you were naturally drawn to in the BDSM community? Did you just happen to meet somebody that introduced you to it? How did that process actually happen? Yeah, so what's kind of interesting is back in 2010, the SF Citadel was a lot different than it is now. Um, they have new owners currently, which are also wonderful. But what it was a little bit back then was a big, diverse group of people. You had communities that would come from all over with different identities, and that would be kind of the home spot. So I met people that were in leather. I met people that were into latex and rope and flogging, and the list goes on, truly. And my first dominant is the, you know, was the owner of the Citadel at that time. And she is identified as leather. So she helped me to learn and understand the different ways in which you can go about this lifestyle and what leather meant to her. And it attracted me so much because it was very much so about earning trust, working together, being on a partnership that had this deep history while at the same time learning that you can make it your own. And so learning from her, I actually had my very first down, passed down piece of leather, which is a tradition that some people still do. And I started to learn from what I call them, like my uncles, my aunts, my siblings in leather. 
and their experiences from, you know, back in the 80s all the way through now. And so seeing her passion in leather and getting to meet more people that were involved specifically with leather, I just, it was like seeing something so shiny that felt so different that I was just so excited to learn more about it. And it is a constant learning about the history from all different perspectives of what leather is. So she's really the one who got me so excited about it. It's really wonderful when you can have somebody like that that introduces you to the kink community and just shows you all of the different possibilities. And I am always so happy when I hear about stories that people have where it's like, oh, this, you know, a leather woman took me in and she like showed me the way. And then I learned from this whole community, these wonderful people. Like I, I hear that so much and it always just warms my heart because I think that really just speaks to, again, sort of the heart of the community and like how wonderful it can be to be in BDSM because I think some people are intimidated by the idea of getting into the community and like not already being like perfect subs or doms or whatever title you happen to use for yourself and then feeling like oh they're not going to take me seriously because I'm not on their level yet when I think a lot of people are genuinely really excited to help out new people and help them kind of carve out whatever their own space is in the community there. Yeah absolutely I think there's this pressure when you're new to come in and think you have to have it all down. But when we think about that, I mean, that's just not possible. (laughs) We can't know everything. Like it's an exciting moment to have. And like, that's what I was welcomed in with was just this excitement for me, which was unlike anything else. It really was kind of like walking into Disneyland for the first time and feeling that special magic moment of like a whole new world before you. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I think with that being said, I want to talk more kind of just to lay some groundwork about what leather culture means in specific, either with like your own experience or just in general, because I mean, we've already probably said the word leather like 30 times (laughs) so far in the first 10 minutes of this interview. And uh, (laughs) I suppose probably a question you got while you were doing your title holding run is what does leather mean to you? So I guess let's start there. Oh, yes. (laughs) So for me, leather means living your authentic self and your authentic life in a way that has very specific attributes like integrity, respect, honor, trust, being accountable, all of those things in a way that is lived out loud. The actual way that I see leather is the physical being, which you can be leather and not enjoy physical leather. That is totally a thing. For me, it's in your heart and who you are within that. I believe that it is an outward cry for our politics. We are fighting for our rights. We are fighting for our freedoms when it comes to the way that we want to love, the dynamics, all within consent. And oftentimes those things are not heard or seen. And so leather is standing up for those rights so that everyone can have a seat at the table and be heard at that table. Uh, For me, it is that trust and that bond that no matter where you go, you will see those other people that are like you in some way, even if it's just this one thing that can bond you together as a wide family all over the world. For your experience in leather would you say that it was something where you had like a leather family like what what exactly does a leather family mean like when you say that do you mean like everyone who identifies as leather around the world or do you have like a household like what exactly does leather family mean as well so leather family and i like to put this into different categories cuz i talk about my leather community as a family all over the world. But then when I talk about my close, like intermediate leather family, that's talking about the people who have helped build um, myself and the family in its relation. So I have my leather brother who was the one who helped guide me quite a bit alongside my first dominant. And that family grew out from his mentor that he'd had for 20 plus years And to my uncle, Jesse, like, I mean, there's so many people that I've had in my life that have become that intermediate and my leather sisters who came after that time and that I've helped mentor and teach them about leather and who they are 
and help walk them through different situations. So you might hear me talk about worldwide leather family and then also my close you know, intermediate leather family, which those are the people I'm talking to pretty much on a daily basis, definitely on a weekly basis to stay accountable, learn from each other, and just be there for each other when things are good and when they're bad. And how does a leather family come to be exactly? Is it something where you just like a group of like-minded people and you choose to come together? Or does it tend to be people who play together, people who are dating each other? What's the typical makeup of a leather family? Honestly, it depends on each and every family. There is no family that's the same. That's what's beautiful about this. Uh, For my leather family, we do not date each other. Sometimes we will play, but it's usually on a more what I would consider platonic style uh, relationships. We actually have certain boundaries with each other. For us, we don't uh, like to complicate Mm -hmm. um, those types of relations with like romance or certain types of sexual activities. So for us and our family, we don't, but I know lots of other families that do that date within that have, you know, different dynamics, polyamorous relationships. So it does depend on who you are. As long as you negotiate and have that consent, then it's totally however you'd like it to be. Ours is very much so a little bit more flowy. We find people that show up. I'm just going to be honest. It's showing up showing me authenticity and each and every one of us kind of coming together and growing our different relationships because, you know, my leather sister wasn't as close with my leather brother to start with. But now after a couple of years, they have this beautiful relationship on their own. That's their own individual. Uh, We are not a hierarchical styled family either, though my leather brother is one of the oldest um, leather members in our, you know, family It doesn't go, you know, that person has to get permission from this person. There's nothing, it's not as strict in our family. And that's just how we personally like it and enjoy it. But other people negotiate those different types of dynamics. For somebody who's interested in getting started with leather or is maybe looking to find a leather family, do you have any advice or is it show up, show authenticity and you'll find the right people? I think it's actually really important to find different groups. Usually, if you are on FetLife and or even Facebook, if you're out in that capacity and can be, it can be really, really helpful. In the SF Bay Area, we have a website that is used through Aero Bay, and it has a calendar of all of the events that are going on all over. And I most areas have some sort of website, even if it's just on FetLife, to show what's going on for interest groups. I always tell people to go to those interest groups, whether it's a munch or specific discussion group, because you will find other like-minded people. Leather is different in every single region and every state. So I always tell people to find those groups. If you have maybe, you know, a girls of leather, a men of leather, you know, leather Latin groups, there's many of them out there. Facebook has quite a lot. So if you can't go in person, they also have them online to just ask questions, to learn about leather, to start working with other people. I'm specifically part of a group called the Hard Pink Sisterhood. And most of our interactions are online. Sometimes we get to see each other in person at different conferences. But there are so many options out there to look for that you can get connected and learn what that means for you. I think it's really important that you learn from other people's perspectives, but that you would also find out what it means for you because that's the most important. Is there anything that you would consider a red flag for somebody who's looking to get into a leather family or looking to get into leather culture? Because obviously, uh, as much as we wish everybody was who they said they were. Uh, I'm sure there are situations where perhaps somebody is, especially online, maybe claiming their leather and they have the secrets of leather and they can teach you how to do it the right way, right? So how do you look out for people like that to make sure you actually are finding the community you do actually want to find? Absolutely. Okay. So anyone, and this is, this is kind of the big standing point. I always go off. If anyone tells you that there's only one true way And you'll hear many people say one two way to make fun of it. Run. I I really do say that is not somebody for you because 
kink and leather and BDSM, as long as there's consent and negotiations, you get to do, explore things how you would like to. If you like to wear glitter, like glitter boots with your leather vest, which um, that's me, like a thousand percent, you can do that. That doesn't make you any less than. It doesn't mean that you aren't, you know, super intense about your leather or your kink. Run away from people who tell you it's only one true way. I would definitely say other red flags would be people who are not willing to give you any recommendations, like people to vet them or their family, and if they are not willing to share their core values so that you can see if things align with yourself. That is definitely a big red flag. Always check out and try to do your research before getting involved if you can. I highly suggest it. I personally don't agree with taking away someone's belongings. Some people have in their leather families the earning of leather. If you, say, had leather boots already, you would have to re-earn your leather boots. You would give them to the family. I definitely say research that. If it feels good for you, then, you know, maybe ask some other people around you their experiences as long as you're consenting to that. But for me personally, if I bought my own leather boots, those are mine. Those are something I have earned on my own. And I love earning leather, but in a different manner and my own negotiation. So that's one that I always say, you know, just check and see how that feels for you and anyone else who's gone through that process before consenting to something that maybe you don't fully have the uh, full picture on. Now, something else I wanted to talk about when it comes to the leather community is sort of the idea that leather is its own separate thing and that you can't be like, leather as well as other things in the kink community like you can't be leather and also like a shibari rigger or you can't be leather and be a little like there's there's not really a lot of I think representation of that has that been your experience is there any sort of stigma within the BDSM community of being leather and then also like doing things beyond I guess what would be considered the traditional ways of participating in leather? So there is a very big uh, stigma around people who don't fit into the norm, which is kind of interesting since a lot of us are actually trying to break away from those boxes and labels that society has, you know, put onto us. And there still are a lot of people who are looking for a certain body type or they're looking for a very specific attitude or the clothes you wear, the way you talk, the way you walk. And that comes from a lot of the history. And to be honest, there's also a lot of still misogynistic views that are put onto the way that leather is. Leather history and culture comes a lot from gay male culture. That has been a baseline, even though there have been plenty of non-male people in leather for a very long time. But that's where we get a lot of the history because most people were paying attention to uh, male people rather than anyone else. And so when we see that, we still are feeling the effects and the ripples from what has been the standard. Nowadays, you're going to see a lot more people wearing whatever they want, what makes them feel comfortable, and being a little bit more out loud and proud of who they are. But it still is mm, shunned upon by some older um, leather community members who still have this idea of what leather is in their mind and that there is no other way. And it's very unfortunate because we actually lose a lot of people who are interested and curious when they feel that there's this strict line of only one way and that's why for me, I have been standing out and being a representative. I wear tutus. I wear my glitter boots. I wear really gorgeous leather outfits. I also am gender queer and I wear some outfits that are a little bit more androgynous and mix with those things. And I have been pushing against the quote unquote norm because every single person is magical and should be able to wear and be how they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think... 
that is one of the barriers it seems for people getting into leather is almost sort of feeling like you have to commit to that entirely as your BDSM identity and you're not like allowed to do these other things and it's it is very interesting that almost as soon as you like you know you're breaking the mold of vanilla society you're breaking the mold of everyday life to be part of the bdsm community only to then immediately jump into another box (laughs) and i think having more freedom with expression and having more ability to express gender in different ways more ability to like like you said wear tutus with your leather outfits you know i think a leather vest with a tutu sounds amazing (laughs) i think (laughs) more people should be open to styling things like that (laughs) and i think that is something where maybe even just hearing this for people who are listening the stereotype of like the the stodgy like 70 plus year old man with the mustache who has a very specific way of doing bdsm is not the only thing that leather is like you will see people like that and honestly every single one of them i've talked to has been great people that are very open to learning about (laughs) new and different things it's not just that you have to follow that mold you you can also break that mold as well uh when it comes to being a leather person and a little like we mentioned a little bit earlier has that been something that's been a challenge to incorporate into your identity like has there been any conflict with that has there been any conflict with people in your community about having that shared identity or has it just been more you know self-exploration I guess I would say I think what's been very interesting for a lot of the littles age players and ABDLs adult baby diaper lover communities is that they get a lot of pushback And a lot of people will not take them seriously, nor do they think that you can be leather and little or age player. Um, I, interestingly enough, have not had a lot of pushback. I have definitely felt the judgment from people when they first see me. If I'm wearing maybe, you know, a onesie and a leather vest, (laughs) um, which has happened because I love that. Um, But... I will get looks and things like, "Mm, you know, first judgment, I don't take you seriously. And then as soon as I begin to speak and and chat with them about these different topics that are deep and, you know, nuanced, they get a whole nother version and they open up their mind. But a lot of times people will not give you that time of day if they see you a certain way and already have a bias against you. And that I I think I've experienced more being a presenter that some people think I won't be able to share in a way that can speak to them. But I have heard from many people that have gone to my classes that I changed their mind. So it's kind of interesting to hear on both perspectives. I have had so many little identified people come up to me after both of my contests now and cried with me. And they said, thank you for going up there and being proud of yourself as a little and not hiding it. Thank you, because I feel seen. And that has broken my heart so many times, because in their local communities, they don't feel like they can be seen. They don't feel safe to express all facets of themselves. And I'm, I am so much more than a little or a presenter or a leather person. I have so many pieces to me. And we all do. And I think it's very unfortunate that a lot of people still have that mindset that you can only be one thing Otherwise, it negates the other. Yeah, I think that is definitely very true. And I agree. It is really good that you're out there and being visible. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is to say, hey, look, there are options for leather. There are options for being a little like you you don't have to just only be one thing. You know, we are we are multitudes or whatever that quote is. And I remember last year, I did an interview with Leland Karina. I don't know if you're familiar with Leland or if you've seen any of... Yeah, I am. Leland is actually from the SF Bay Area. (laughs) Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. No, because they've kind of ping-ponged around a little bit um, as far as where they're located. (laughs) Yep. And uh, I remember Leland brought up during our conversation that as far as the lesbian leather community goes, or at least the the lesbian BDSM community, age play and CGL is a lot more normalized than it is in the heterosexual BDSM and leather community. So it's almost this kind of jarring experience 
to go into the HEC community and see the, not conflict, but the degree of uncomfortableness or the degree of lack of knowledge about it and just to see that difference in how accepting different groups of people are with different kinks and different ways of having BDSM relationships. And I think it's something where it's definitely changing, which is good because it wasn't something that people really talked a lot about, at least in the heterosexual community, like 10, 15, 20 years ago. And it's just interesting to kind of note that there's that even within leather, depending on what groups you're a part of, it's a very different experience. It really is. And what's kind of interesting, as you were saying that, I kind of had a little light bulb go off because my first experience realizing that I was little was with my female identified partner (laughs) who was very welcoming and the other girls that were in service to her were also littles or middles. And so that was very interesting because I fought it for a very long time. I fought it for about a year because I didn't want the stigma of, you know, I I had heard people talk about littles. They thought everyone was just a brat. They thought that they didn't have boundaries or that they were just too much, too much to handle. Mm -hmm. And for me, that triggered a lot of my own personal trauma that I have had growing up as a young person and feeling like I was always too much. So I didn't want to also bring that into my dynamics and relationships and kink and leather. And so when I would hear those things, I'm like, I'm not a little. And all of my friends around me who were little or middles of some sort, and even my dominant were like, it's okay if you are, we're here for you. However, you know, you want to explore or not explore. We love you as you are. And we had a lot of different littles events at the SF Citadel And (laughs) I ended up getting really excited because I attended an event and helped watch over their dog. And I found that I was just so excited. And I finally was like, okay, that's it. I'm a little and I'm here. Show me all the things. And so I had a lot of support, but in that specific group. And definitely like a lot of the lesbian communities, a lot of uh, specific women identified communities had a lot of mommy play. There were femme daddies. There were caregivers. And I mean, just, you know, all kinds of people that were into this. And it wasn't really a big deal. But in the heterosexual, you know, relationships in kink and BDSM, it was a little bit more considered creepy or taboo. And a lot of people weren't able to have those conversations in what I would consider to be productive way is they would typically shut down a little bit and um, kind of put down some shame on those that were identified as such. And is that something you've seen change at all since you've started in the community? Oh, yes. Like, I mean, even five years ago, there were not as many big age play events or groups. I mean, we even have conventions now that are specifically to that topic of age play for bigs, littles, middles, you know, adult baby diaper lovers, the whole big umbrella part of that community. And I actually went to my first one last year. I had never done that before because it wasn't an option. It wasn't even able to be promoted uh, because of the stigmas and people not understanding that we're talking about consenting adults. So I have seen it grow. Most conventions I go to have the topic of age play or littles of some sort. It definitely is still a minority, but I feel like I actually have literature that I can read now. That wasn't a thing. I couldn't even find anything besides like naughty stories. It's been a big growth in education and hearing more people talk about it openly, especially on YouTube, which has been interesting to see. And I still find myself, because I love YouTube, but I still find myself being tripped out that I can find other people talking about some of these, you know, really vulnerable things and places that they're in. Yeah, I've even noticed that too. And I'm not an age player. I'm not a little, but I continually hear about, you know, new people who are making channels, who are talking about their stories and not only just middles, but also caregivers too as well, which I think is even more of a, of a missing piece for talking about this in the community. Because I know a lot of littles and S types that have littles as part of their identity that are open to talking about their experiences, but 
finding caregivers that are willing to talk about it is seemingly even more difficult. You're so right. Well, I mean, I think that there is a lot of fear and stigma uh, when it comes to these things, especially from, you know, a caregiver or a big or, you know, that kind of type of person, sometimes dominant, sometimes not, because it's not the same thing to be a caregiver and a dominant. But I feel like there's a lot of stigma around those things, especially if people feel that that would put them in danger if somebody found out that information Mm. that doesn't understand what is happening. I think that that is a big thing that can happen for those people to feel nervous to talk about. It's a very vulnerable place for those people as well. It's not just vulnerable for the S types or the littles and middles people. It's also vulnerable for them to share those things. My daddy teaches alongside me and will give their perspective when we're teaching specifically when we're talking about age play and people have so many questions for them because oftentimes they're not hearing those perspectives ever, almost ever. Hopefully that's changing. And I know it's, it is really great. Like when there are educational classes, like I've, I've been to a couple, like it, probably at least one at every convention I've been to. There's one about age play or littles or middles or some combination of that. And there is always at least a little bit of a conversation about the caregiver side of things and how to especially incorporate that or change that within an existing dynamic and kind of become comfortable with that role. If you've like spent your entire BDSM career as like a dom and now you're adding daddy to that as well. If you're adding mommy to that as well, that can be a big change depending on what your style is like. And it can be a whole new process of becoming comfortable with your identity. Oh yeah. Head spaces. I have eight dynamics with my partner, with my um, live-in partner, and that can be interesting to change and, you know, work through the different transitions. It's a lot of fun but also challenging at times. Yeah. And actually that is something I wanted to ask about because it, it seems in particular from members of my audience who are littles, there is a struggle with balancing headspace, like especially when there are multiple dynamics, like I'm a little and I'm a service submissive and I'm a rope bottom and I'm a this and I'm a that and trying to one, figure out like appropriate times to be in those various headspaces so like nothing is getting left behind. And then also being able to express to your partner when you're in which one of those modes. And have you developed any sort of secrets or tips for balancing all of that? Yeah, um, I'm actually working on a class about this. My partner and I are still fresh in some of our newer dynamics. So we, we want some more time to get through that. But I think the biggest tips I would say for people who are going through this are one, find out kind of what your core dynamic is or what your neutral point is. For some people, that might be a DS relationship, MS relationship, service-oriented pet play. Um, There are so many different, you know, baselines that you can be. Uh, For example, my partnership is relationship first without the dynamic. That is our highest priority to us in our partnership. On top of that, so I kind of look at this like a house. It's not hierarchical, but it's kind of like foundational pieces to this house. So on top of that would be our daddy-girl relationship. That is pretty much our like neutral all the time space. We also have an owner-property relationship, me as the S-type. And that is a very different feeling and headspace. The daddy side is a little bit more caregivery when they ask or command things. And the owner property type of relationship is a little bit more stern. And we have pet play. We also have our switch dynamic where I am ma'am and they are my girl. And a few others that are a little bit more outskirty like primal play, certain pets, I'm a T-Rex and, you know, things like that. So those are kind of the light bulbs and the fixtures in the house. The way that we have best found for us to change headspaces has to do with my name. So when I'm in little space, usually it's Brie Brie or Hey Little Girl, things like that. That will kind of be like auditory sensors for me to go, oh, that's who you're trying to call to right now. And if I am in that headspace and available for that, I will also respond in like, yes, daddy, or, you know, tone of voice might change. 
And then if uh, the the M type comes out, owner person comes out, it's usually a little bit more direct, like Brie. <laughs> and once that tone comes out, I have to respond in a way that is either within that dynamic or ask for a, you know, I'm not available for that headspace. Can we talk about that? Because sometimes that call and response doesn't always work if a person's not in that headspace or ready for that. When my ma'am headspace comes out, if I say, hey, girl, and they're like, uh, no, that's not going to work out real well in that time frame. That means we're not available for that and to talk through it. So if you can have, you know, terms that are good triggers for you to be able to respond to, whether that's names or a certain word, that's been really, really helpful for us to switch in and out and to understand where the person is coming from. We even have conversation safe words to make sure that, you know, within like our 24 seven dynamic that we're still on the same page and we are in a healthy um, relationship and headspace for those things. That would be my biggest thing. And if you can have conversations, check-ins, maybe, you know, once a week or once a month, depending on how your dynamics are, that has helped us to communicate better throughout our time. Yeah. I mean, communication is really, it's a pretty good suggestion for a lot of things. And I think having something simple like that, like the change of terminology can be pretty powerful, even if it's relatively simple. The one thing that I think I am still not hundred percent sure about is like actually balancing the headspaces like not just in terms of communicating to your partner like when you're in a certain headspace or when you're in a mood for something specific but making sure that like the different facets of your BDSM life are all being acknowledged and taken care of like have you ever had to deal with or do you have any advice for situations where like maybe you haven't been able to engage in age play for a couple of months and it's not really for any like particular reason. It just hasn't really seemed to have come up or maybe you feel like you've been neglecting the service side of your relationship or neglecting, you know, anything else about yourself or anything else about your relationship because there's just so many different options of things that you could be engaging in. Absolutely. It is honestly a struggle when having multiple dynamics and everyone experiences it differently. We tend to talk about what our wants, needs, and desires are as often as we can. I know communication feels like a silly, you know, answer, but it it is. It's communicating what those needs are. So, you know, we actually have it on our calendar. I'm one of those people. I love calendaring. It helps keep me aware of what I'm doing and what I haven't been doing. So every Wednesday, my daddy and I have what's called booty tang. And it's literally on our calendar as that. It means intimate time with each other. And for us, sometimes that switches off from play. And then other times it happens to be like intimate acts together for our touch, as that's one of our big love languages. And being a title holder and a presenter and traveling almost every weekend can push things off to the side more than what it was before. So we will discuss, you know, hey, I really miss time with my girl. Ma'am space feels like we haven't had a chance. How are you feeling about that? And then we'll discuss what that looks like and if we can, you know, schedule a weekend or schedule a date to be able to do that together and explore further in that dynamic. It can be so hard to balance them. But what we have found is constantly keeping that channel open, that there's no shame. There's no, you know, I want you to tell me, I want you to tell me how you're feeling and what those desires are within our dynamics. My certain pet personas don't need as much time as my baby girl side does. My, Ma'am space is growing and sometimes my partner is not as available to be in their girl space. And that can be hard because I'm very new as a top and as a dominant. And so I, I have this desire to keep growing with them in that area, but I can't do that with them unless they're able to be in those spaces. So we chat about them And if they're not available, sometimes I will actually go to YouTube to listen to other dominants. I also will read other books like The Heart of Dominance, The Loving Dominant, different MS-type relationships 
to also feed that side of myself and then share what I've learned, even if we can't be in that dynamic at that time. But it is a struggle. Absolutely. And it's something that is, we're still growing in. We just keep communicating with each other about those wants and needs. Specifically, one of them I don't think a lot of people talk about or remember is our sexuality and where we are on those scales. My partner is uh, on the gray sexuality scale, while I am a little bit more on like hypersexuality. And it's actually why we have it scheduled for once a week to have that intimate time because for my partner, if they don't have it on a schedule, it's not something they think of. And they enjoy the intimacy from our relationship, but it's not like their first go-to. And so for me, I can feel neglected if I don't get that certain kind of touch or feeling desired. And that has been something that has really helped us to keep it on the schedule. Life happens, but then we commit to a different time if, say, we had to reschedule on, you know, instead of Wednesday, it'll be Saturday because we're both very tired. (laughs) And we just work around it and make sure that we're accountable instead of like pushing it off over and over. Yeah. And I think that is really good idea is to have something on the calendar. I know not everybody is a calendar person or some people just have really hectic schedules where it's like, I'm on call literally every day for like 12 hours. So I don't actually know if I'm going to be available until like an hour or two beforehand. But if you have any ability at all to schedule out some time just to check in. And I really like the idea of almost like, I want to call it role self-care, like sort of taking care of your own identities on your own. Like it's always great to be able to engage in things with a partner, but there are definitely ways that you can connect with the various aspects of yourself when your partner is not available for any reason. Something that I think we always think, oh, I am only X if I have my partner or have a partner or partners to do these activities with or these dynamics with. But There's a lot of options to be able to nurture those sides of yourself, even if those people or you don't have a person in your life right now to engage in those things with. There are lots of ways and discussion groups that you can be part of also that can help feed those parts of you and allow you to continue to grow on your own journey. I really do believe that it's important to still feed yourself as an independent person, no matter what dynamics that you have. And that's something that we both have done when I'm not able to be in ma'am headspace, my partner still, there's an online school for certain things that they can do and have fun with. And we have found ways to be able to do that uh, within our own boundaries and needs where we're at in those moments. So I think we've been talking for already almost an hour already. That's so crazy. And <laughs> I think we've actually laid some pretty good groundwork to go into sort of the last area I wanted to talk about, which is dark age play in particular. And I am wondering how exactly do you define dark age play and what makes that different from, I guess, the stereotypical age play that somebody might picture or might assume is what people do? So the first thing when I address this is everything is under the consent of uh, consenting adults. I feel like a lot of that's a big stigma and I always want to make sure people understand that that's what we're talking about. So just to start off, it's consenting adults. And the way that I have described it is dark age play is the act of sexual energy, violent actions, or less than, this is a quotes, innocent interaction with a person who is in a regressed or different headspace than their biological age by consenting adults. It is a spectrum. It is not all the same for people. For me personally, I like to mix those different things that um, as long as they're negotiated and okay with people. But for example, my partner has broken my crayons, ripped up my uh, drawing that I'd done for them, and uh, made me clean up the pieces. And for some people, that's not sad. But for, you know, some other people, it's a really difficult thing and really, really heartbreaking to have those things done and also fun because I am an emotional masochist. So if those things can work for me, it can be such a fun place to be cathartic. It is not therapy, but it can be a release. Maybe you've had some, you know, moments where you felt like you weren't a good painter or a good drawer 
And when you're little, you love to color and then you negotiate with your partner. It'd be really fun to be told that I'm a horrible, I can't draw on the lines, you know? There's a lot of fun ways that you can incorporate these things and they're not always sexual. They're not always sadistic. They're not always those very specific types, but they can be. And you can change that on how you feel and what things are pleasurable or happy for you. And actually, it's funny you bring up the story about the broken crayons because this reminds me of something that happened to a friend and they're actually not into dark age play there. They don't have that kind of dynamic at all, but they have a stuffed chicken that is like their normal aftercare toy. And they're a, they're a fox, they're a pet player, and they have it every single time they have aftercare and they negotiated for a scene where they would have the chicken destroyed and then they would be given back the destroyed pieces. But it wasn't actually the real specific toy. It was like a replacement that the partner had gotten on Amazon or somewhere else that was, it was meant to feel like it was the real one, but it actually wasn't. And at the end is like the surprise <laughs> actually like your such an animal is really fine, but like you can definitely play with those darker elements oh, and yeah. like have quote unquote dark play. It's not just limited to, to age play. And exactly. Yeah. It's, and it's, I think it's something that maybe people delineate specifically with age play simply because they think it can be kind of, jarring to see the different ways that people engage in age play because on the one hand you have the person who's like coloring their daddy a picture and it's like a cute little like butterfly and they're wearing a pink dress and then the other side you have somebody who's engaging in like an 1800s victorian school like spanking scene and it can be kind of like wait these are both the same thing <laughs> in a way I don't think we necessarily do with some other types of play even though there is always a spectrum in the way that you can engage in something yeah you're so right like, I think that because it has been such a taboo topic and I mean even if you think of the word dark age play like it dark it's this you know kind of it already has this feeling of naughty or feeling of taboo even in the name itself and I know people are kind of working around trying to figure out how to have those conversations and possibly even change the name of it. I have heard some people talk about light age play, which means no dark age play. So there's more discussion and vocabulary that is being worked and seeing how to have these conversations and open it up. Some people think when we say dark age play, we're talking about medieval times, which is really cute. When people walk into my class and they're like, what is this? And I'm like, oh, disclosure. We are not talking about medieval times. You have brought your chain mail to the wrong place. <laughs> so it can be silly like that. But it is, it is, you know, just like you might want to do some, you know, mind fucking or things like that. You can do that in any kind of play. It could be someone's favorite outfit and you're going to threaten that you're going to cut it off. But you aren't going to actually cut it off, you know, and... You can play with those things. So it's very similar to that. It just happens to do with um, age play and that type of dynamic. I am also wondering along these lines when it comes to dark age play, I think one of the most difficult things that people deal with is like learning how to express an interest in it because I think a lot of times people introduce their partner to the concept of age like especially if they're not already in a bdsm or kink relationship is like hey so i just i'm into this thing and it's not a big deal but i like you know watching kids cartoons and i like this kind of specific clothing that puts me in this headspace and like it's not really a big deal and then that's fine but then maybe they want to start introducing those more taboo elements that are a little bit less likely to be accepted or understood right away do you have any advice for how to approach wanting to do dark age play and is the approach different for somebody who's familiar with bdsm already versus somebody who's not familiar with bdsm for me when i first started i was very nervous to share with anyone especially since i've always really been into dark age play that was kind of the same it was one for me it wasn't really separate, um, which I found out that more people were not okay with that than even just being a little. And so I went to a lot of different classes in the SF Bay area with lots of different types of caregivers and S types that were also into dark age play. And they shared with me that, you know, you have to be careful with who you're talking with 
and sharing because sometimes people can use this as you know, a toxic form of uh, abuse in relationships, especially if you've ever had trauma. And I learned very quickly that a lot of people can try to use this, especially if you're on the S type scale, that people will try to use this to ha- form like very specific attachment bonds. And it can happen in DS, other different DS relationships as well. But this one can be a very specific vulnerability that can be very harmful if you're not aware of what people are doing. Sometimes you'll get gaslighted. I mean, there's a lot that can come with it. I would suggest that you learn a lot about yourself um, and explore. I would say there are different books that are out there. Uh, Penny Barber is someone who has written different handbooks for age play and diaper lovers. Lee Harrington is also another author and I believe there's a few more that are coming out. It's very limited, to be honest with you, when it comes into literature currently. But those books have helped me a lot as well as YouTube and working through a few different articles online to understand who I am and that identity. And then I suggest if you have a partner or someone that you're interested in to be upfront, just like you would about your other desires because informed consent is really important. So I would suggest, you know, taking it slow, learning about them, having them learn about what it means for you to enjoy those types of play and then continue those conversations around, you know, Oh, you know, I might think it would be fun if you were to break my crayons and make me cry and then spank me and talk about it in those ways that feel safe and comfortable for you before you go into having a scene because it can be triggering if say maybe the bottom all of a sudden can't do that thing and you're the big and you're you're trying to make sure they're okay but they're having a big triggered moment or vice versa so go slow have the conversations Part of consent and informed consent is talking about those desires and things you might be interested in and see how they react. If they are not interested, then you might want to have some conversations about your desires and that maybe there might be, you know, another way for you to to connect or maybe it's not a good match in that area. That's what I would highly suggest is take your time, have the conversations, but make sure it is informed consent. Don't start having a scene And then randomly start calling out daddy or mommy or some other type of word or identifier without their consent. And also without having the conversation that it's something you're interested in. You'd be really surprised at what people are into that they haven't talked about yet because it feels vulnerable and scary. And for people who are on the receiving end of that information, like let's say somebody's listening to this and their partner just came to them and said that they're interested in age play or being a little or a middle or, or something like that. What is maybe a good way to start learning about this from a caregiver perspective or at least what are some like maybe misconceptions that you know of that people have about age players or littles that aren't necessarily true? So like we talked before, there's not a lot of information that's written from the people who are the caregiver perspective. Uh, The books that I have mostly um, been able to read are all from the uh, little middle age player S type side. Penny Barber is uh, a mommy uh, and also a diaper lover. So you get a little bit of both perspectives from there. And there are a few YouTubers who talk about their perspective as a caregiver. What I suggest to understand first is ask your partners what that means for them because a little middle age player doesn't have one description. It's very intimate and personal. So first find out what their identity is. What does that mean for them? What does it feel like? How do they want to feel? I ask those questions for when someone wants to get flogged. You know, how do you want the scene to be? How does this make you feel? And not all littles, middles, or age players are brats. There's nothing wrong with brats. Brats should be celebrated. But don't assume that everybody is that same way. They are not all submissive. Some of them are switches. Some of them are dominant. Sometimes littles can be real mean in the best of ways. Make sure that you ask what type of activities that person is interested in trying 
or what they already know they like. Not everyone likes to color. Not everyone likes stickers. You know, sometimes I just want to play video games. And they're all different. Not everyone likes to watch cartoons. Make sure that you ask them what their personal interests are. And ask about any triggers that they might know uh, for their own selves. Because I think it's really important. We're talking about a lot of psychological play. That you also understand where their mental health is at. Is there anything that you should know? Is there any mental health you have? I think that's a really important to have in general uh, information about yourself and your partners, uh, but definitely to have those conversations so that you know if you're going to dive into a dynamic or a play scene regarding age play, that you are aware of what those safety nets are and how to take care of each other in the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think really, if anything else, asking them what they're into and like anything, if they've explored anything already is so important because like you said, not everybody is into coloring that not everybody likes Care Bears or My Little Ponies. Like I, they could be really into Invader Zim. Like, you, you yes, know, yes, that could yes. be their thing. <laughs> and I, yeah. And I think it's just important to recognize that because I think sometimes the, the flip side of the like, oh, I don't want to do this and I'm into it is like, getting too into it is like oh you want to do this great and then you just go out and you buy a bunch of stuff and you prepare a bunch of things without actually having the conversation with your partner about what they like and then they're like oh I actually don't really like the color pink in my little headspace I'm more of a purple kind of girl and the, yeah it just saves a lot of I think headache and miscommunication if you pause to have those conversations when it does come up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that goes with anything, but just ask those questions. Don't assume it will save you a lot of heartache, especially if you're like, yay, I want to support my partner in this and I'm willing to try these things. Let's do it. And then, like you said, you go out and buy all those things and your partner doesn't even like one of those items. Um, You will save yourself time, money, and energy by asking questions and listening, active listening Uh, to what they are wanting to experience, need, and if they line up with you. I'd also say if you have been trying this with a partner for a while and you are still not as into it or maybe you're like, I'm realizing this is not something for me, please communicate with your partners. It's so important that we aren't pretending to be into something that isn't serving us. If, you know, if doing it as a service makes you happy, that's great. But if it's something that you really are realizing it's not at all feeding you, have those conversations. They are hard, but they're absolutely worth having because it will save you a lot of energy and it's it's a trust factor to be able to communicate all of those feelings regarding whatever dynamics or play you're into. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's one of the I think dangers potentially with introducing this to a partner is kind of the fear of like are they really into this with me are they really okay with it and I know I would be horrified if I brought something up with a partner and then they just like faked liking it for me because part of the reason why it's enjoyable is because I want everybody who's participating in it to like consent to it and also enjoy being a part of it so if you're not into something that your partner brings up regardless of if it's age play or anything else like definitely like you just said like bring it up and be honest because it's going to be better for your relationship long term even if it's maybe disappointing for your partner to hear that you're not as into the thing that as they are absolutely well, I think we are probably coming up on time here. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Was there anything else you wanted to bring up before we wrap up our conversation today? I think we've mostly gone over everything. I think the last thing I would want to say is your path, your journey is yours. This really is a playground for you to be able to explore and you are exactly wonderful as you are. So anyone listening, I hope that you know that you don't have to be one true way. There's nothing like that. You get to really make this your own wonderland and I hope that you will get to enjoy that and remind yourself that you are worthy of exactly being who you are, where you are. Exactly. Yeah. And thank you so much for everybody for listening to this conversation and hopefully you learn something new. If you have any follow-up questions, if, if anybody listening has any follow-up questions, is there a place where they can reach you, Bree? 
Yeah, absolutely. So you can email me at breeburning at gmail.com. You are also able to find me on Facebook, which I'm very public on, and that is Brie Burning. Same thing for FetLife, Brie underscore burning. You can find me in all of those places. Feel free to message me. I love having those conversations. And if you just need an ear, follow me there. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your thoughts and your experiences. I am excited to have you come to KinkFest this year and present. Are you going to be teaching any classes in particular? Do you know? So I know that they're still working out the whole schedule, but I know I am teaching the Dark Age Play class. So if you happen to be at KinkFest, definitely come out if you're curious. And I will have handouts and everything for that. I'm very excited. This will be my first KinkFest. <gasps> Yay. All right. Well, I am excited to see you there. I am excited to see your Dark Age Play class. Hopefully, if anybody listening is interested, there's opportunities maybe still to get tickets or if you're going uh, you know, bookmark it, see it on the calendar as soon as you can. And yeah, if you guys uh, want to ask any follow-up questions or anything else, links to what Brie mentioned will be down in the description box below. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe because I make videos twice a week, including these wonderful interviews with people talking about all sorts of different kink-related subjects. And until I see you guys next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye! Bye!